Once again, a very good morning to all of you. As already been introduced by Commander Dr. Pragya, without much delay, we'll start. Anybody who is associated with biological sciences and academic conference must be knowing this great name called Dr. Vikas Patnaik. I have witnessed him many times. Also, he might not be knowing me personally, but I know him and some knowledge about his work. But in the meantime, he has done a lot of work. But I hope today's presentation will be of immense benefit to students mostly. And delegates, of course, will be benefited. And uh, a brief introduction as I was advised to give uh, Dr. Patnaik, he is a MSC from Samarpur University, then University of Delhi campus. He got his PhD from University of Delhi uh, in biophysics. Interesting. Uh, students, those who are into pure biological sciences, they get a, a side of the interface of biological sciences these days, definitely through the presentation of Dr. Patna today. And uh, uh, without much detail, I know I have a lot of many things to speak about Dr. Patna, and I will definitely hand over the personal view by Dr. to the delegates and students who are interested to know about this great man, and you are supposed to know. And without much delay, I will invite Dr. Patnaik to continue with this deliberation. Good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, good morning. Um, can you hear me? Is the audio working? So you're audio. Okay. Thank you. Um, good morning. Um, and uh, thank you, Pragya, for putting this uh, meeting together. And then uh, I welcome everybody to this session. Uh, I should say that uh, this is a warm uh, good morning from us because it's uh, outside. It is about negative 40 degrees centigrade here. So with that, I just wanted to share uh, some of uh, my recent uh, results. And since this is a meeting on uh, recent advances in biological sciences, um, I just wanted to share uh, my um, experience on the clinical significance of protein translation, which affects uh, both physiological and pathological processes. Um, I don't have any financial conflicts of interest, but our gene therapy has been patent, has been licensed to Hubble Therapeutics, which is, uh, who is developing it for clinical uses. So my outline for the talk would be, I would like to introduce you all to gene theory, then discuss disease mechanisms due to gene mutation. Then I'll talk a little bit about the Precision Medicine Initiative and how we are taking part in that. Then how my lab is involved in drug development for one of the ion channel mutation. And we have taken this drug development from bedside to bench and now to bedside. And this is a very unusual combination. So when we talk about gene theory, so we start with cell, nucleus, and then the uh, chromosomes you have. And then the chromosomes is packed with uh, strands of DNA, which you can see this DNA is extended. So the gene theory says that the traits are passed from parents to offspring through genes, and then genes are comprised of DNA. 
So this will be, the talk will be mostly focused on these, how traits are passed from parents to offspring, and then how uh, genes are com uh, comprised of DNA. So my um, life has uh, come full circle. I uh, did genetics and my specialization, uh, specialization was genetics when I was in life science. And then now also I do hardcore genetics, uh, human genetics. So here in this DNA strand, you see this sequence here, GTT, um, which translates for a um, amino acid leucine. And then when the leucine is there, it is part of the protein, which is a polypeptide. So leucine will make one part because the gene will have a start codon, stop codon, and then leucine is in the middle. So it makes to the protein structure here. So when we have a missense mutation, you all might know about missense mutation. Like for example, here, this was GTT. So the T has been mutated to C. So when it is GCT, instead of a leucine, now this is a serine. So this is a missense mis mutation, means we have introduced a different amino acid than what originally was in the wild type. But then there is also one thing which we know about nonsense mutation, where the mutation is instead of the GTT, it's a GAT or TAG, which is a stop codon here. So when we have this nonsense mutation stop codon, this introduces a premature stop codon within the uh, open reading frame. So the protein synthesis is never complete. So that's what is involved in this talk. And then I will uh, go through uh, clinical cases here. So visual impairment goes unnoticed. So if you see how do we discover these patients with visual impairment? So this is a classroom, typical classroom. A uh, subject is sitting in the back bench and then he complains to the teacher that I can see. Then in the next class, the teacher will move the subject to the front row. Uh, and then again, the student complains that, no, I mean, I can, I still can't see, right? So then the student is moved all the way to the front when he still complains that he can see and then he's advised to see an ophthalmologist. And that's when the patient comes to the clinic. So here is a case of a 41-year-old male who was a full-term birth, you know, normal uh, vaginal delivery. And then this patient complained of um, uh, vision problems, like this is a nystagmus. That means, I mean, he doesn't have a stable vision. His eyes move left and right and strabismus, so he can't look straight. Uh, and then photophobia, so he was complaining about light um, uh, induced uh, problems and then cataract and then also the visual acuity was um, uh, down and then if you look at his retina here these are the images of the retina so it has pigmentary appearance so the retina doesn't look clean i mean there are pigments distributed everywhere so this is a uh, this is a um, clinical uh, measure which is called electrophysiology so if we do clinical measure on a normal patient here on the left you see black, um, red, blue, green, and then uh, these color traces. So which are the response of um, eye to light uh, flashes. So we produce different amount of light uh, or different intensities of light. And then the eye responds with this electrical response like your EKG and ECG. So this gives us a waveform where you have this downward deflection, then upward, and then it goes back zero. So this says, where these waveforms are coming from the retina. So these are on the normal patient. Whereas here in the patient, the case one that I present here on the uh, middle, you can see that all of them, they don't show any response. So it's almost like flat response here in this patient. We saw another patient who was a 10 year old. So pigmentation, you see some, a little bit of pigmentation, but not as much as the other patient because this patient is young. And then there is some response here. We followed the same patient when he was 21 year old. You can see the uh, electro, uh, electrical response in the retina is flat. So it doesn't have any response. And then there is a little bit more pigmentation here. And then we look at the structure of the retina. So there are other clinical investigations are done. So here, this patient, when the blood samples were sent, for um, testing, genetical testing. So we found that he had a mutation for a tryptophan codon at position 53 with a stopped codon. So this is a G2A mutation. 
So what it is, I talked to you about this patient. So here you can see the um, in the uh, normal uh, individual. So the sequence will be TGG. In this patient, it was TAG. So that's why it has a stop codon mutation here. So what it is, is this is a liver congenital amyresis. This is a blindness, a form of pediatric blindness, childhood blindness. So this is on the right is a normal retina, which you can see pink appearance. This is normal. You can see the blood vessels and everything looks normal. Here on the left, there are three patients who have different pigmentation uh, of the retina. So these patients almost like contribute to 20% of children who attend to school, they have this kind of a blindness. It may not be the same gene because there are 21 different genes which are responsible for this form of blindness. So in our case, we know that this is uh, this gene um, uh, encodes a protein, which is a potassium channel, inwardly rectifying potassium channel, KAR 7.1, and then a tryptophan at position 53, which is conserved. Uh, has been altered to a stop codon and this is in exon 2 of the um, uh, gene and then what it does is if you have a wild type you can see that it uh, translates to a normal protein which has got two transmembrane domain here you know a short end term terminal and then the c terminal whereas when we have the stop codon here then it uh, only gives us a truncated end terminal codon you don't get any of the transmembranes nor the c terminal um, so how did we do that to study this? What we did is we um, um, uh, took a site-directed mutagenesis approach. So you take the ORF, which is the um, gene, and then you mutate the sequence that you want and then study it in an exogenous system. So we normally express this in hex cells or CHO cells, and then we do electrophysiological recording. So here you see this is a presentation of voltage on the x-axis and then current on the y-axis. For a typical wild type, this is in black. So th that's why it is called an inward rectifier channel because it's bending inward. Whereas for our mutant, which is in red, you see that's a flat line, which is same to non-transpected control cells in blue. So there is no difference between blue and red, whereas the black makes a normal curved appearance of the channel. So when we looked at the expression of the protein, so the wild type here uh, on the left, it appears on the membrane, whereas mutant, because it's a truncated protein, it appears everywhere in the cell. But to make sure that the actually the protein is made, then we tagged it with the end terminal antibody. So we do see a protein which is made for the truncated protein. When we run it on a gel, then you can see this is GAP. This is a wild type KA at 7.1, which is about 55 KDA. And then this is the mutant, you know, which is less than. 30 kDa. So that shows that we are just getting a GFP here, but not getting the protein product that we want. So this uh, protein is present in the retina pigment epithelium cells, which is back of the eye. So here is a video you can see. So these are nucleus here in blue, and then you see the labeling in red. And then what we do is we mark the protein in green. So if I saw the cells which are uh, expressing the red, they also express green in these uh, immunocytochemical uh, studies. So what it shows that these particular cells are expressing the protein that we are interested in, which is the KIR 7.1 uh, protein present in the RPE cells. So, to, so we use a unique model where we use a stem cell approach where you can take a, a biopsy sample from the patient and then uh, so you grow them to fibroblast and then you can differentiate these cells. So you can you make them pluripotent and then you can differentiate to make them the cell type that you want. In this case, we are studying retina pigment epithelium. So we made them into retina pigment epithelium. So this way you can have a wild type, you can have the patient and then you can compare here. That's exactly what we did here. So this is the patient here on the top, W53X, and then uh, this is the control from the same family. So we collected sample. So this patient has a TAG mutation. And then this, uh, the control sample that we collected from the family is TGG. You can see here that the patient also has a A and then G. So this is a carrier. Um, uh, parent. So this, but then primarily it is TGG. 
when we look at um, the D, uh, DNA expression, so they both express DNA, but when you look at protein, because we look uh, for the um, uh, for the complete full uh, length protein, so you see only for the wild type, but not for the mutant. So this gave us an assay that if we did any therapy and we can show some mutant is being now converted to wild type, then we know that our therapy works. Same thing when we can, because these are ion channels, we can record their electrophysiological response. So here is an example of wild type in the black, and then in the red is the mutant. So you see that the wild type makes some current, whereas mutant doesn't make any current. So to amplify this current, we use an ion, which is rubidium. So wild type is significantly amplified. And then because mutant doesn't make any channel, so you don't see any amplification of the current. So it's a signal enhancer. So we don't see anything even with the signal enhancer. So here is the expression of the protein. So in the control IPSC, we see green, which is the wild type um, channel. And then in the patient samples, we don't see green. So that means they don't produce the protein. So because this is a gene uh, defect, so first approach is, okay, let's try gene therapy. And this is uh, the first approach, uh, first successful gene therapy for an ion channel. So after we uh, introduce the wild type gene to these iPSC cells or to this patient um, iPSC RPE cells, stem cells, then you can see in green now, which was not present in the disease cell, now we see these uh, proteins are present. They are not only present in the cell, they are present on the cell membrane where they are supposed to be. And then here, electrophysiological recordings also showed that we are getting current through this channel, which are now made in the cells where they were not originally there. So then, so it works in the cell. Now we wanted to test in the animal model. So this is our mouse model. I will skip the video for the timing. So here you can see, this is a uh, in the center, this is a control mice. So where we have this electrophysiological response, you know, this is a healthy mice. So healthy mice before treatment in red, healthy mice after treatment. So we did a mock treatment in these mice after four to six weeks. So the waveform has not changed here. Whereas this is a mutant mice, which we generated by knocking out the uh, uh, gene in the mouse RP. So you can see the response was flat here, this response typically that we were talking about. And then after the gene therapy, we see a rescue of the uh, response here, which was comparable to the wild type um, animals here. So not only that, so we saw that the retina is now intact after injection. If we don't inject, the retina is dying here or there is cell loss. Uh, cell death degeneration in the retina, whereas here it's all the layers are protected and then their visual acuity, which we measure for the human also, we can do it for mouse. So we can see that here the wild type and then the gene therapy are green and blue, which look similar and then non-treated is in red. So I showed you that this is a nonsense mutation, but we use gene therapy and then we can show that there is result. But then read through is something which I wanted to show you this video. So the this is a open reading frame. So you have the start codon, you have the stop codon. So if I use this as a ribosome, so the ribosome will start at the start codon and then the ribosome will try to go through this sequence till it finds the stop codon here. So now if I introduce a stop codon here, premature stop codon, so the ribosome will start here and then the ribosome will go to this premature stop codon and then stops there. Right? So then it doesn't go any further. So that's how you have the truncated protein. So now there are ways you can manipulate this premature stop codon by which what you want to do is you want the ribosome to cross the premature stop codon and then go through this sequence so that at least you can make the protein uh, full length protein product. So here is again what uh, the same illustration. So for a wild type, you have a normal protein product here because protein synthesis is complete. For a premature stop codon, uh, there is a eukaryotic release factor will come and bind to the stop codon here, which is TAG, and then you have a terminator product. But when we say that, okay, we can easily put pressure on the ribosome so that 
you know, there is a competition between the eukaryotic release factor and the A T R N A amino acid T R N A. So a T R N A will get inserted, and then as a result, you will get a full length protein product. And that's the treatment we did here in our stem cells. So here is the wild type again. Here is the mutant. But the mutant, after the treatment here, there are four different treatments you see here. These are different drugs, like this is NB84. These are ELOX03 you know, and ELOX01. These are all commercially available through uh, our uh, partners. So we tried this and then saw that there is a current response after treating the cells with these drugs. So, so here you have the, what I said is you have the DNA here. So DNA is made into RNA. RNA has to um, uh, exit the nuclear membrane to the cytoplasm where it binds to our ribosomes will bind to the mRNA. And then if it is a wild type, it will make the channel. If it is a premature stop codon there, or there is a nonsense mutation, then it doesn't make. So now what we are trying to do is, you know, I mean, so we can do gene therapy, but by doing gene therapy, we are trying to manipulate the gene in the nucleus, which now we don't want to do. So what we want to do is to be safe. We want to approach with a drug which will manipulate this system or this whole translation in the cytoplasm. So what we are doing is we are taking the uh, uh, tRNA, wild type tRNA, and then modifying or uh, side, doing side directed mutagenesis to the anti codon so that in presence of a stop codon, for example, here I have shown. So this is the UCG is the normal, but then UCA is a stop codon. But if I mutate the anti codon of this tRNA to be recognized by the UC, UCA, then the same amino acid will get inserted here in spite of having the nonsense mutation. So we are not manipulating the gene, we are not manipulating the mRNA. All we are doing is we are tricking the translation, protein translation mechanism by introducing engineered tRNA where we can serve the therapeutic outcome. And that's exactly what you see here. So our therapeutic tRNA has been delivered to the retina. And then these are functional rescue by electrophysiological recordings. So the other advance, uh, the other advance, biological advance is genome editing, where you can go and precisely change the base that you want. So here our interest is TAG, which is the mutant, and we want to change it. So here you can see we have used the CRISPR genome editing and then base editing by which we can precisely change this TAG to TGG. And then the percentage of correction we get is almost like 50% and then here 40%. The problem with that is you do correct that, but then you do have random um, um, uh, base changes here because the, of the editing or because of the nickage. So that poses a problem because we do normally manual electrophysiology, but you get so much of variations by doing the genome editing that you need an automated patch, which um, uh, we are using right now. So this is an automated patch, which has robotics and everything. So now in the manual patch, we use only one, uh, we can patch only one cell. Here in this one, we can do in one sitting 64 cells. So that gives us this, this one, you can see a comparison of the panel, which is an electrophysiological read-through panel. And then here, these are the wild type. And then these are our cells, which are the mutant, but then after the base editing. So there is no difference between the wild type and base editing. We have here comparison of 65 cells, 65 wild type cells are similar to 65 mutant cells after base editing. So in a not cell, what I have shown you that I have taken a disease model from the clinic to show how the disease work or the uh, molecular phenotype of the disease. And then I have shown different ways how we can cure it. It's because I'm studying a nonsense mutation. This is some of the mechanisms that I have discussed here, like read through and tRNA. They are not um, possible for a missense mutation. So that's the advantage of me showing you an example of a nonsense mutation. So we have taken the, so we did the target selection, we did the discovery, medicinal chemistry, you know, I mean, we did in vitro studies and then in vivo studies. Now we are trying to take it to the human. And our human patients are everywhere. You can see throughout the world, we have some in US, UK, France, then UAE and Japan. So it's not possible for a lab to take a therapy to that. So that's why we have a company. So we have this Hubble Therapeutics through which we have already FDA permission that we can treat patients using our gene therapy. 
And so this is a, a, a presentation on phenotype characterization to identify uh, effective drug and to bring it to the clinic in record time for a delightfully unusual combination of nonsense and rare mutation. This is a therapeutic value of fixing a gene. So you can see that this study is, I mean, massive, and it's not only possible by our group, which is uh, several uh, postdocs and PhD students and then undergrad students, but our collaborators, both uh, at the University of Wisconsin and then elsewhere. And then I have received significant funding from NIH and then also private funding uh, from anonymous donors or private foundations. Thank you for your attention. I can take some questions. I don't think the audio is on there, so I can't hear. Please, any queries? Any questions? Questions? Please, 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 please. So very excellent talk. I want to know this gene also. So this gene is only mutated the K C N J thirteen gene only mutated in the retina or in other part of the body? That's a good question. So, KIR 7.1 protein or the gene, I mean, is present also in other organs. But the thing is, it's involved in normal physiology of the retina, but not in other organs. So, in other organs, what we believe is it's used for disease prevention, but not for maintenance of the life. Whereas in the retina, it plays an important role in your light perception. And then, so that's why it is causing blindness. We have seen these patients, they don't have any other phenotype except their retina problems. Thank you, sir. Good question. Thank you, Dr. Patnaik, for enlightening us in such a nice, interesting topic that entails everybody's interest. Very encouraging. And definitely we'll go through the presentation once again because there are a lot of things to uh, learn for the first time. And a student will be definitely more interested to know something. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. The hope that see you once again in any other conference. Yeah. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you.
Thank you, Pragya. Am I audible? Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes. I would like to intervene here. Uh, I have to uh, say one thing. A few days back, Dr. Subhati Mukhopadhyaya was infected with COVID and he was not sure whether he will be able to give a talk or not. And he told me that if I will find okay, then I will uh, I to present the talk. And yesterday he communicated me that he can give a talk and he, for, beforehand he has asked for me, he has asked us to adjust that he, he may have some coughing problem. So, Dr. Muko we are extremely I... fortunate that if we are, uh, you are among us, deliver a talk. And we wish you a speedy recovery. And we hope that your talk will be very much insightful. Thank you Thank for joining us. Thank you. Am I audible, I guess? So I'll share my presentation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Audible. Uh, ju just give me a second. Let me open this. I'm just having Hello and welcome everyone. So before I start my talk, I would like to thank Pragya and all the organizing committee members of RABS 2022 for giving me the opportunity to present my talk. I have kept the title of my talk as Understanding Cancer Biology from Molecules to Metabolic Engineering Driven Therapy. To introduce myself, my name is Shuhadeep Mukhopadhyay. After earning my PhD from Professor Shujit Kumar Bhutia's lab at NIT Rao Kela, I started working at NYU. I became interested in cancer biology because of its fascination that it starts to invade and it's really difficult to control its growth. So I would like to introduce you to how cancer actually progresses. Let me take the laser pointer here. So a normal cell, when it undergoes rapid, uncontrollable proliferation and multiplies into a huge cellular mass, it gives rise to a cancer tumor nodule. And later, what happens is that these tumor nodules invade into the blood and lymph vesicles, by virtue of which it is able to travel to far distant secondary locations. And this process by virtue of which cells are able to migrate to much more distant places from its primary site of location is called as malignancy. And these cells are known as malignant cells. I became curious about cancer because they are able to evade 
a very important resist mechanism which is called as apoptosis that is a type 1 form of programmed cell death now this hallmark of cancer is characterized by its ability to proliferate and they are completely able to evade this death mechanism which is characterized by nuclear fragmentation cellular blebing expression of proteins like caspases and nuclear fragmentation now they how metabolically they evade this kind of apoptotic phenomena is very intriguing and during my phd in professor bhutia's lab we showed that they evade this by a mechanism called as autophagy which is known as self eating so this is highly protective and beneficial to the cell but in reality this mechanism of autophagy is supposedly for our own benefit when a cell is under stress see during time of infection virus infection or during high temperature low temperature alteration during ph variation these various stress <coughs> causes development of a double membrane initiation mem initiation phagophore layer which enwraps all this stress particle and give rise to this double membrane structure called as autophagosome that later fuses with lysosome to give rise to autolysosome now this autolysosome in very simple terms behave like the ultimate shredding um machine that we have in our office just to shred all our papers and stuff and what it does is it helps in degradation of long lived proteins and damaged organelles and these comes in the form of autophagic cargo and ultimately there is release of nutrients de novo and these helps to circumvent stress now <clears throat> in ideal condition when autophagy in normal cell it is extremely beneficial during um, bypass the stress condition but in cancer cell there is a dual role now talking about dual role of autophagy leads us to understand how it behaves now what is the duality suppose in the very initiation form of a tumor nodule a uh, cancer cell undergoes a very high form of autophagy during the time of tumorigenesis it might lead to its killing and this is extremely beneficial to the patient <coughs> but suppose the autophagy somehow they escapes these tumor cells and they these tumor um, nodules which are right inside a uh, tumor um, mass where there is a huge deprivation of micronutrients and there is huge accumulation of waste so there is a huge form of stress and these cancer cell now hijacks the patient's autophagy mechanism for their own benefit and what they do is they turn this protective for their own benefit and results in giving rise to therapy resistant malignant cells so the goal of an ideal strategy would be to inhibit this form of protective autophagy and to trigger this form of lethal autophagy so professor bhutia's lab have established different forms of prostag between autophagy and i won't go into that detail with that experience that i gained in professor bhutia's lab i will show what i have started to work in my postdoc when i joined nyu i was assigned a task where i was said that this pancreatic cancer i just started learning about pancreatic cancer at that time our lab at alec immelman's lab at nyu it was working very hard on pancreatic cancer and rewiring its autophagy now why pancreatic cancer is so difficult to treat 
it is because they have a very poor survival rate in us only 9% of the patient barely survive and the most sad part of pancreatic cancer is that when a patient reaches to a doctor's clinic for pancreatic cancer pain or something he has already reached stage 4 before stage 4 the pain or uneasiness that a patient feels is totally hidden and that is the most lethal aspect of it now how the pancreatic cancer is so lethal because they are actually enwrapped by a sheath of stellate cells that results in an impenetrable barrier to drugs or any form of immune cells that can actually attack the pancreatic cancer and naturally we can understand that this makes them extremely therapy resistant and again very sadly it is predicted to be the second most cause of cancer death in us by 2030. now biologically pancreatic cancer are able to survive this way because they are hijacking the patient's autophagy now in this panel what we are seeing is how a normal pancreas is undergoing a transition so acinoductal metaplasia panin like these are different stages ultimately leading to pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma the short form is PDAC. In the entire talk, I will be repeating this advanced stage of pancreatic cancer PDAC many times. So this is the transition picture. And now, what is the major marker that leads to its transition when we see here? So this is the cartoon representation, and this is the actual representation from a patient. And when we did the immunohistochemical analysis for autophagy marker one can clearly see that the pancreatic normal duct gets completely changed when there is ihc analysis for lc3 which is the autophagy marker we can see there is increased intensity of autophagy from normal to penine and ultimately there is a very high expression of lc3 in pdac now how these pancreatic cancers are able to sustain and survive this kind of lethal atmosphere where there is so much tissue wastage uh, but still high autophagy so autophagy must be supporting them something metabolically but till date the exact metabolic composition of um, pdac was unknown so my goal was to analyze what or how autophagy supports the pancreatic cancer metabolically so how i started to address this problem was i took different form of cancer cell lines so first i took the this cancer cell line 8988t and i inhibited them using atg5 atg5 is one of the genes responsible for autophagy like it uh, i am also taking atg7 so i genetically inhibited autophagy using atg5 and atg7 using two hairpins these are stable expression and i pharmacologically treated these cells with chloroquine cq so what we see in these red boxes are that we performed a long-term survival assay or uh, the college, uh, clonogenic assay where we see that these red boxes indicate the drop in their number of colonies when autophagy is inhibited now we try to rescue the colony number using different types of antioxidants tested over here like nac mnt abp uh, epsilon etc now what was the reason why we tried antioxidant is that when we inhibited autophagy we found that when we are using um nac or trolox their ROS was decreasing so we thought that might be there is a ROS component for this 
that is responsible for their clonogenic number decrease. But as you can see that although the ROS was decreasing, there was not able to support them metabolically that resulted in their colony rescue, which is actually a very sensitive assay. And we found that definitely cysteine level is somehow getting hampered. So from this assay, that was the ultimate take home message that we took. And as I said, this 89880s data we translated into a panel of 13 cell lines of PDAC origin. And we found that chloroquine plus NAC was able to rescue in all of them. Now, we again did genetic and pharmacological inhibition of autophagy and did a total amino acid estimation in each of them and we found that the chloroquine and ATG5 inhibition resulted in a very strong significant drop in cysteine as we can see in these red boxes corresponding to cysteine. So beside that another very important revelation was that the cysteine uptake we found that when we were treating the cells with chloroquine, there is a very vast reduction of uh, cysteine uptake. So there has to be something wrong with the cysteine transporter for this PDAC cell line. Now, coming to the cysteine transporter, SLC7A11, this is a major cysteine transporter in pancreatic cancer. And very recently, it was showed that these pancreatic cancer are actually oxytrophs for cysteine. What that I mean is um, they are unable to perform um, synthesis of cysteine by themselves, and they are heavily dependent on this transporter, SLC7A11, for transport of cysteine from the environment. So we did a proteomics analysis unbiased analysis and after eight hour and 24 hour we did see that there is significant accumulation of slc 7a11 that is the cysteine transporter was accumulating we validated this proteomics finding in 89880 and pank1 using the genetic model where we see that in our western blot that slc 7a11 is increasing along with in these red arrows where we showed in multiple cell lines using chloroquine that there is accumulation of slc 7a11 after uh, pharmacological inhibition of autophagy as well we then took the validation of this in vitro finding for our in, vi in vivo work we use three orthogenic uh three use three um different um uh, three different um marker three different uh in vivo models and in the first model we used the pharmacological approach where we implanted the murine um pancreatic tumor and treated them with chloroquine and after we harvested the tumor we stained them with slc 7a11 in the second model, we use the KPC mouse model where the ATG4B was dominant negative. Now, ATG4B is one autophagy, important autophagy gene. Here it is a dominant negative. So ultimately, we have a KPC system where the mouse develop a tumor in its pancreas. And since it is ATG4B dominant negative, it will be inhibiting autophagy. So it, here also, when we stain for SLC7A11, we see a very clear increase for uh, SLC7A11. And in the third model, what we did was we used a genetic uh, knockdown model where murine tumors bearing ATG7 hairpin loss were injected into um, B6 mouse model and we see that all of them have 
very strong increase of SLC 7A11 staining. So the ultimate uh, theory, what we found is there is increase of SLC 7A11 accumulation through in vivo and in vitro. But what is actually happening? Because we see that the cysteine level is actually going down, but the transporter is going up. So the natural question that we wanted to raise was whether autophagy led to a drop in its uh, SLC7A11 activity. And upon checking, we found that indeed the SLC7A11 accumulation that we were seeing were non-active component and they do not actively import cysteine from outside as we can see from these assays after ATG 5 or 7 uh, deletion we see that the cysteine uptake is very low clearly showing that SLC 7A11 was inactive now the next question we wanted to figure out where exactly is this metabolic transporter going after it is becoming inactive the actual location of SLC 7A11 is at the plasma membrane where it is supposed to pump in cysteine from outside but we wanted to figure out where it is now going so I will show this time-lapse video imaging this is taken right at the moment after we added chloroquine in the cell so the green thing that you are seeing is one single pancreatic cancer 8988T GFP tagged with SLC7A11 bearing cell now what you will be seeing is that the green dots which are the indicatory marker of the SLC7A11 the cysteine transporter they are coming off pinched off from the plasma membrane now i'm going to play the um see where is the video link yes so you can clearly see that these uh pinched off vesicles are coming off the plasma membrane and they are accumulating inside the cytosol now we validated this confocal imaging data using extraction of plasma membrane and cytosol. And we found that there is indeed accumulation of SLC7A11 in the cytosol, which we can see over here. And the plasma component is decreasing. So the question now remained how and where are these inactive component going so for that what we did was we stained different organelles present in the cell to find out where this SLC7A11 is actually going ribosome mitochondria ER Golgi and shown over here is the positive data where I would be showing the exact location. The other organelles that I mentioned, over there, there was no co-localization. And here we can see that when SLC7A11 was co-stained with LAMP2, another marker for lysosome, there is, so this is the autophagy intact condition. And here we are using chloroquine and here we are inhibiting with LC3 knockdown we see a very high accumulation of LC3 at the lysosome as indicated by these yellow puncta we further verified this by immunopurification of the lysosome by uh, pulling down these lysosome in cells having ATG7 inhibition for this purpose, we use this tag HATMEM192. This is very similar to LAMP2. And we can clearly see that there is accumulation of SLC7, SLC7A11 in this immunopurified lysosome. Now, 
what was the exact mechanism by which these inactive SLC711 actually localized at the lysosome? Recently, this group, Paul Michel from UCSD, have shown how SLC711 or another name by which it is known as XCT. Here they showed that mTOR C2 actually phosphorylates XCT at the serine 26 site that makes them inactive. Once it is inactive, it um, now becomes highly carcinogenic and other stuff they have shown for their um, work on glioma. But in our case, what we found is that when SLC7A11 became uh, inactive, then after inhibition of autophagy, we could see that um, when we are treating chloroquine, SLC7A11 became inactive and there was accumulation of this S26. So when we mutated to S26A, we lost this interaction with mTOR. So this is the active uh, uh, component of the mTOR motifs, and we could see the SLC7A11 uh, interaction. So this led us to conclude that mTOR indeed resulted in inhibition of SLC7A11 when autophagy was inhibited. When we generated two mutants, the S26A, which is always active, we could clearly see that SLC7A11, regardless of chloroquine treatment, was always on the plasma membrane. Was but the phosphomimetic mutant, S26E, we could see that it is always off the plasma membrane. And it was much more lysosomal, as we can see from the lysotracker co-localization studies and the localization studies of the plasma membrane. And beside that, the SLC7A activity in these cells were much lower, clearly because they were unable to import that much amount of cysteine. So finally, what we did was we um, inhibited the mTOR C2 active component Richter, and we could see that the co-localization that we were achieving when we were treating with chloroquine to inhibit autophagy over here, we were reducing when Richter was inhibited, and this co-localization was reducing. So ultimately, we came to this conclusion that when we were inhibiting autophagy in pancreatic cancer, then SLC7A11, which remained active previously, became much more lysosomal due to mTOR-C2's activity of P26 phosphorylation. Besides this, we also showed what was the physiological revelation of uh, autophagy. These pancreatic tumors are clinically known as extremely cold. By cold, it means the clinician means that there is very less amount of immune infiltration in them. But when autophagy was inhibited, there is a very vast uh, immune infiltration of T cells and macrophages, mainly because there is degradation of these MHC1, and these became much more surface, and they were inviting these uh, immune infiltrating uh, cells. So we are doing a follow-up of this, and now I'll try to conclude the talk by acknowledging Professor Bhutia and his lab for mentoring me during my PhD tenure, Professor Mondol and Professor Maiti, who have been stellar in my uh, PhD scrutiny member, and Professor Alec Kimmelman, who has been my postdoc mentor and my present mentor when I'm working as associate research scientist. And with this, I'd like to take questions. Thanks a lot. It was a nice deliberation. Although I understood a bit, I hope for many of the students have uh, benefited immensely. And you are lucky to have your guide, Professor Bhutia, out here. And I hope some of uh, 
relevant questions will definitely come up from uh, Dr. Kuti. Not to uh, show his intelligence over you, but at least to educate you all, especially the students present over here. So, as uh, Dr. Mukhopadhyay told, it's open for questions. Anybody having any any silly fundamental questions for the students you can raise, is that to explain you. Sir. So it is a nice moment for me. So one student, when one student is introduced to another student, very good. Well, it's my pleasure. And now asking the supervisor is asking the question. So I already I have gone your paper, PNS paper. Sir. So in one slide you saw the LC3, the LC3. Right, right, sir. So it is detecting the uh, LC32 or LC31? Uh, sir, it is actually detecting the repeated LC3. Repeated LC3. Sir. Okay. So, so the right? Right. Okay. So then we can buy this one. <laughs> so you will send us details. <laughs> Have no other question, so you take care, sir. Sir, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Dr. Yeah. Nice. Hopefully, we'll listen to you more and more in future. Thank you, sir. Wishing you good health soon. Thank you. Take Thank care. You, Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.
Abdit, your uh, microphone seems to be off. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I think sorry uh, for that. Uh, my slides are visible. Is my slides is visible? Hello. No, sir. You are no, audible. Yes, yes, you are audible, sir. Okay. Visible okay. Also. Please share oh. your screen. Okay. Uh, yeah, now it's visible. Hello, can I start? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, yes, visible. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Advit Parita, and uh, now I'm in Texas, a postdoc research fellow. And uh, thank you all for giving me a chance to present my talk on this. Uh, it's a chilling outside. It's minus 10 and it's night 11.20. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I'm now, now I'm going to present my uh, topic of my, uh, sorry, my topic is uh, investigating the role of methyl CPG binding domain proteins from Arabidopsis and tomato. So uh, during my uh, tenure of research, I did uh, work on many topics like DNA methylation, fruit ripening in tomato, nitrogen fixation, plant pathogen interaction like that. But today I am going to present on uh, DNA methylation. So <clears throat> we all know that uh, DNA is composed of four nucleotides, different type of nucleotides, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thiamine. Out of this, cytosine is usually found to be in methylated form. So, and the abundance of cytosine methylation is so, it is so ample that this is called as the fifth base of DNA. So there are some enzymes called DNA methyl transferases, which uh, put a methyl group in the fifth carbon of the pyrimidine ring of cytosine and produces five methyl cytosine. So in case of plants, methyl cytosine occurs at CPG sites commonly known as CPG island and it is present in both plants as well as in animals but in addition to that in case of plants there are some non-CPG methylations are there like CPHPG and CPHPH H is any other nucleotide except G so uh, now there are three different players of uh, DNA methylation in, in this process so the first one is the writer, that is the methyl transfer transferases, DNA methyl transferases, which add 
a, uh, a cyt uh, methyl group in the fifth carbon of the cytosine residue. And the third one is the eraser, that is the DNA glycoxylase, which removed the methylation group, actually is not removed the uh, only methylation group. It removed the whole cytosine and by a repair process, it uh, it uh, uh, maintain another normal cytosine with removing the uh, methylated one. And the third one is the reader. The proteins which recognizes and binds to the methylated site, they are called CPG binding domain protein, methyl CPG binding domain proteins. So uh, my uh, today's talk is based on these proteins. And these proteins read the signal, bind the methylated site irrespective of DNA sequences. So <clears throat> in case of Arabidopsis, there are uh, 13 MBD proteins are there. And out of them, I work in four. So, but today I will stick to two. And uh, in addition to MBD domain, there are some other domains are also present. That is MBD associated domain or MAD domain, AT hook, PSD, NLS, Bromo domain, BRAC domain. These are also present. But I'm not concentrating on those things. So uh, the first experiments that was uh, uh, that I did was to screen them. We are predicting or we are we have some hypothesis that out of some of the proteins out of these 13 may involve in RNA mediated gene silencing. And uh, for that, I uh, screen those MBD mutants and find out one gene which is involved in RNA mediated gene silencing process. And then to find out the mechanism, I did some protein interaction studies. So that I, I'm going to show one by one. So what we did for uh, screening of genes which are involved in methylated, uh, which are involved in gene silencing, what we did, we took the wild type Arabidopsis plant and the mutant of Arabidopsis of any of the MBD gene. Okay, then we uh, developed a transgenic using GUS gene or the UID, UIDA gene. And in the second transformation, we try to silence this GUS gene using an artificial microRNA that targets the GUS gene. And our hypothesis is that in case of wild type, this uh, UIDA artificial microRNA will silence the GUS expression and there will be no GUS expression. But in case of mutant, if the mutant or the gene is involved in uh, RNA mediated gene silencing, then the GUS gene will not silence. So for this, what I did, I used PKMBR2301 uh, vector and transform them to Arabidopsis. And these are and they are ex the GUS expression were analyzed. They are showing GUS expression. This is the wild type untransformed one, and the rest three are the three independent lines of uh, PKMBR two three zero one. This has a selection of kanamycin. So NPT two gene were and HPT two gene both were uh, checked, and they confirm that they are expressing the GUS gene. Now. The second experiment, uh, the, the second stage is to silence this GUS gene using an artificial microRNA. So here I use an artificial microRNA and everything of this uh, artificial microRNA has, uh, that is the artificial uh, the microRNA of uh, MIR164C loop was used, but the 21 nucleotides from UIDA gene was used. So after silencing, in case of wild type, it got silence. It got silence in all other MBD mutants except MBD6. So uh, MBD6 was selected from this work. And to find out the mechanism, uh, I performed some protein interaction study using a yeast to hybrid screening, then FRAD analysis, and then I uh, find out the mechanism. So from this, I select MBD6 and perform one each two hybrid uh, analysis. I just want to tell you one thing that uh, what is each two hybrid analysis? This is a technique to study uh, interaction between two proteins. One protein is 
binds with the GAL4 DNA binding domain and the other library or other protein is binds to the uh, GAL4 uh, activation domain. And when both the protein interact, the GAL4 binding protein and the activation protein comes along with each other and activate the uh, histidine gene. And after, if it is interacting, then this will grow in hist minus histidine medium. So both the bait and prey were transformed and the screening was performed. And I found three different genes, which are the putative interacting partner of MBT6. One is RPS2C. It's a ribosomal protein. Second thing is the NTF2. It is a nuclear transport factor 2. And another is the last one is R3S domain containing protein, the R3H protein. So uh, in the first experiment, uh, I found that the MBD6 is uh, involved in RNA mediated gene silencing process. And here in this uh, uh, H2 hybrid analysis, I found three protein and all protein are RNA binding protein. So this gives us a, uh, you know, um, extra support that MBD6 is involved in RNA mediated gene silencing process. So for further, what I did, I did the localization of this protein. You can see this is the whole cell and uh, this is uh, MBD6 is localized into the nucleus. This is the, uh, you know, zoom out uh, size of uh, the nucleus and you can see some patches in the nucleus. This gene uh, localized to the highly methylated region. That's why there is more signal in some of the region of the nucleus. In case of the prey, all these three protein localized in the nucleus as well as in the cytoplasm. And they have the similar pattern as that of uh, MBD6. That means they are co-localizing. They are very close to each other. So here I did this experiment using MBD6 was cloned with fusion with uh, CFP, whereas the prey, RPS2C, NTF2, and R3H gene, which clone in fusion with YFP. Okay. So now, now I did a FRAD experiment. Uh, before I go, just I want to tell you what is FRAD experiment. Uh, this is the fusion protein that MBD6 is binds to CFP. It's a fusion protein. And uh, CFP will absorb uh, light at 458 nanometer nanometer and it emits at uh, 465 to 500 nanometer and the other protein is fused with YFP. So when this protein will be very close to each other, the radiation or the light emitted by the CFP will capture by YFP and it will give you higher uh, wavelength uh, light that is about 250 uh, 225 to 600 uh, sorry 525 to 600 nanometer so from this experiment it can be concluded that if these two proteins comes very close then we got a frat positive signal so here is the frat positive signal and this is uh, this is the donor that is the cfp bound with the MBD6 and the acceptor binds with the, all these three proteins and the FRAD efficiency was very good more than 10 percent means it is interacting so uh, from this I can conclude that uh, these two three uh, these two proteins this MBD6 interact with the uh, RPS2C and TF2 and uh, R3H protein okay now now the uh, I produce one working model how these interaction works. So the R3S, RPA, RPS2C, and NTF2 all are RNA binding proteins. So they bind with the RNA. They moves to the nucleus. And uh, yeah, one thing uh, after moving the uh, we have also uh, I have also found histone deacetylase six that interacts with MBD6. I am not showing that data. OK, so after that, this histone deacetylase 6, the uh, RNA will recognize the complementary site and binds with histone deacetylase 6, and it will remove the histone deacetylation mark. Then 
some of the DNA methyl transferase and histone methyl transferase act on it and it produces a condensed chromatin and the gene got silenced. So this is all about uh, MBD6. Now I'm moving to uh, another gene that is uh, MBD4. So while I was screening all these uh, genes for RNA directed DNA methylation, I found that this MBD4 mutant has altered root phenotype. So we, we, we that, that this mutant has a tDNA insertion mutant in the second exon of the gene. I checked by Northern that uh, this gene is not expressing and uh, the mutant the mutant was verified and after that the phenotype was studied it has uh, the root length is less density is more and the secondary roots are less as compared to the wild type plants so uh, then we uh, perform one microarray experiment to find out what is happening inside the plant in the mutant so we found 200 and, uh, 329 differentially expressed gene. Uh, out of them, 242 are upregulated and 87 are downregulated. Some of the genes are uh, verified using quantitative RT-PCR to validate our microarray data. And you can see the microarray data which are getting upregulated and, and qPCR data is also showing upregulation and the down regulation similar things okay now uh, yeah uh, and the, when i analyzed those uh, differentially expressed gene i found that most of the gene fall in three different categories one is the phosphate starvation temperature stress and flavonoid biosynthesis uh, and the root phenotype of uh, the mutant suggests that this is involved in phosphate starvation because during phosphate starvation uh, plant root has altered phenotype so we check uh, different uh, there are different uh, uh, microarray data available in the public domain so i compare my data with other data and uh, you know, for example, this MBD4 microarray data is the wild type root and wild type shoot of phosphate starvation Arabidopsis with the PHR. PHR is the one of the most of uh, master regulator of phosphate starvation. It, it, it has also some genes which are in common. So based on these uh, common genes, I uh, find out that where it act actually uh, just forget about MBD6, MBD4, that this is the, the all pathway were known. There's PHR and PHL, and uh, they activate the microRNA 399, and that, that produce, that activate ubiquitin 24. And 4 gene and PHT gene got silenced, and that leads to uh, expression of uh, purple acid phosphatase, secretory for purple acid phosphatase as well as uh, some other genes which which can uh, uh, which are necessary to maintain the phosphate condition in the plant and from this i found that mbd4 act on spx1 and spx2 and these genes uh, act on phr so uh, while uh, publication publication the reviewers was very uh, confused with this because we, we we are supposed to put the mbd4 uh, above the phr1 but it is true finally we uh, this paper was accepted okay and uh, yeah now i'm <coughs> moving uh, towards some crops that is tomato so we have identified uh, 18 MBD proteins in uh, tomato and here also yeah, there is a similar cases like uh, they have other domains along with the MBD domains. Now, uh, so I did one uh, real time expression analysis of these genes in different fruits as well as stress conditions. I'm not showing the stress condition, I'm concentrating on the fruit. So. Uh, they have three three different stages that is matured green breaker and red ripe so this these are this is matured green breaker and red ripe the expression of all these mbd genes were analyzed 
as well as the MBD expression were analyzed in the Rin mutant and NOR mutant, uh, NR mutant. So uh, from this, uh, I found that uh, these genes are getting down-regulated in the red drive. Most of the genes are getting down-regulated in the red drive. And uh, most of the genes in the mutant are very less expressing. Some of them are uh, highly expressing, but most of them in general, most of them are very low expression as compared to the wild type plants. So uh, this is uh, the process of ripening. And uh, in case of mature green, their expression level of the wild type is high. But it, while it is when it is getting ripened, the wild type, uh, the MBD genes are getting down regulated. But in case of rain mutant and the NR mutant, there is no uh, expression change is there and the expression is very less. So uh, the next step is to select any one of them and do a virus induced gene silencing. These techniques needs uh, two vectors. One vector has the viral replicase. Hello. Hello. Hello, Hello. Dr. Advait. Yes. Here is a problem. Uh, we lost power here for some time. Maybe we'll resume it in a minute or so. Okay, okay, please wait okay, one okay. minute. Maybe. Okay, okay. Thank you. But you are visible. Hello. हाँ तो मैं देखता हूँ जो हाँ आड़ कोई लाना सुन किसी को दाना मोरा बस सुबह जी अच्छा अच्छा ठीक है चल कल मैं पास कॉल करूँ हम्म
आदित्य हाँ दा हेलो हाँ दा नमस्कार लाउड स्पीकर कोड आ रहे हेलो लाउड स्पीकर टाइम टाइम हाँ सुजिता नमस्कार हेलो हाँ सुजिता नमस्कार हाँ नमस्कार नमस्कार अच्छा ये आमरे एक करेंट पड़े जी बुझ लो हाँ हाँ हमरा कैसे समरे सारी बाव तेरे इटा माने ठीक है ही पानी से ये बैकअप डा अच्छा तो मैं रात ही आधा आउ बेसी नहीं मरो पांच मिनट हो ची पांच मिनट हाँ पांच मिनट जा करेंट आमरे कितना आशय जोड़ा नहीं ना अच्छा अच्छा तो कैसे टाइम मिला नहीं सेठी आह अब तो राती बारह बजे लाय दस पच एकारो पचास राती पचास लाय नहीं हम पचास नहीं चो तो ठीक है राही तो नो प्रॉब्लम आई कैन वेट आई कैन वेट हाँ 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 ठीक है ठीक है हाँ अरे अजीत हाँ प्रोग्राम हाँ हाँ am I audible हाँ yes yes sir now you can we can resume the talk okay okay hello the slides are visible slides are visible Hello, am I am I audible? Visible. Yes. Visible. Okay. Okay. Fine. Fine. Okay. Slides okay. are okay. visible, sir. So, uh, Please continue. Yeah. I I was slides in this. Are visible, sir. I was in this continue. slide or this slide. Okay. So the process of ripening. This is the process of ripening, and the MBD genes are getting down regulated during the process of uh, ripening. Now. Uh, I stop. I've just started about the virus-induced gene silencing, and uh, the virus-induced gene silencing is a process by which you can silence a specific and targeted target gene. So uh, here there are two vectors. One is for the replicase, and that replicase as, as well as the, its its contain the uh, some protein of the virus particle and the Code protein. The other one contains the code protein along with our targets. So I choose uh, three genes from uh, the real-time data and did the virus-induced gene silencing. Both were transformed to agrobacterium and then injected into the matured green fruit. 
of tomato you can uh, from this this uh, this is the normal ripening the control one only vectors is there and uh, this is mbd3 this is mbd7 but the pros the, the the you can see a drastic change in the pigmentation in case of mbd6 the pigments are lost so again i check the expression level of these three genes in their respective virus induced gene silencing fruits and they are getting down regulated now now uh, i have checked the uh, fruit characteristics especially the firmness uh, this is done with a texture analyzer and uh, the texture analyzer has uh, this machine will uh, check the uh, strength of the uh, tomato and from this you can see that there is a drastic change in the mbd6 virus induced gene silencing uh, fruits whereas the 3 and 7 are normal it's equivalent to the wild type plant wild type fruit now uh, i have also checked the some of the carotenoid and lycopene the carotenoid is getting upregulated but this is not that much you know uh, because this is very less because uh, as compared to, this is high as compared to the control hello but uh, the chlorophylls are getting down regulated in the ripening process yeah. but this is not happening in mbd6 as well as the lycopene content is almost lost in mbd6 uh, virus induced gene silencing process so this this is all about uh, the tomato one so now i can move to uh, the conclusion that uh, uh, finally we conclude that the screening of mutants identified mbd6 gene as uh, mbd6 involved in rna mediated gene silencing protein interaction studies suggest mbd6 interact with the rna binding proteins and microarray identified uh, microarray analysis identified the involvement of mbd6 mbd4 in phosphate starvation and uh, virus induced gene silencing analysis suggests that the mbd6 is important in fruit development uh, before I thanks, I will like to thank Pragya for giving me a chance to speak on this. I would like to thank Professor Arun Sharma from Department of Plant Molecular Biology South Campus, my PhD mentor, uh, and my current uh, PhD mentor, Cecilia Timor uh, for her kind cooperation and uh, giving me a chance to come to Texas again. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, if you thank you, Doctor Advait. Now, yeah. Now, some of our delegates have got uh, some questions for yes, you. Yes, yes, I'm ready for that. Okay. Uh, Aditya, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. MBD four and six difference. Uh, Uh, MBD4 and 6. Yes. Dif what is difference in their uh, yes. regulating this? Okay. Uh, MBD4 and MBD6, you are asking about the structural property. They have amino acid similarity. They have amino acid similarity in their uh, domain. Okay. Uh, and the function is totally different. You know, uh, MBD6, MBD6 involved in RNA-mediated gene silencing process, whereas MBD4 is involved in phosphate starvation. Okay. Okay. So they have similarity in their domain. What? Hello? The genes are conserved? Yes, yes. Yes, the MBD domain is conserved, but not the other gene. Uh, MBD4 also contain a zinc finger domain in it, but MBD6 do not have. So, is there functional difference in tomato and uh, aromatopsis? Yes, yes, there is functional difference as well as structural difference. And MBD6, what I present in the tomato is not the homologue of Arabidopsis MBD6. 
so i i put the nomenclature of these genes and according to their chromosome uh, localization chromosomal position i uh, named them 1 2 3 4 based on their chromosomes this work published yes yes both the work published and third work the tomato work is not published is the tomato work yeah. partially published very good aditya thank you okay okay